All right. Whoops, just one second. All right. Are you ready? Is everyone buckled up? Uh, today's Torah portion is Vayalach, and that means, and he went. This is from Deuteronomy 31, Moses. Uh, this is basically the day he dies. As a matter of fact, it was also the very day he was born. Uh, on the Hebrew calendar, it was the seventh day of the month of Adar, and he's about to give his farewell speech. I mean, if all of you knew that today was going to be your last day, Day, wouldn't you want to make sure you said everything that was on your heart? So we have to understand when we read this, this is more than just text. It's God's word that through Moses, he wanted everyone to hear. They talk about, you know, declarations, your dying declaration, how important that is. Well, this is Moses' dying declaration. But what I want to do, I'm going to start with the Haftarah, which is the portion of the prophets that go with this Torah portion. And then we'll jump into the Torah portion. But it is just so amazing. Look at Hosea 14, verse 1. The month of the lull is all about what? Repentance, returning. So repentance isn't turning around. Re Repentance is going home. You could be turning around and still going the wrong direction. The word repentance uh, in Hebrew is to, to return as well, but it means go home. You've run away. Just going to a different homeless shelter doesn't get you home. He wants you to go home. But look at Hosea 14, verse 1. It says, O Israel, return. To the Lord your God, for you have fallen by your iniquity. And then look at verse 9. Who is wise, and he will understand these things. Who is prudent, and he will know them. Now look at this. The ways of the Lord are what? If you remember, the first believers were called followers of the way. And then it says, the just are going to walk in God's ways, but the transgressors are going to fall. So where's the problem? It's the same way for everybody. The righteous have no problem walking and on the very same path, the unrighteous stumble. So is the problem with the path or with the heart? That's where the problem is. As a matter of fact, I mentioned this last week, but I liked it so much, I want to tell it again. Many people come to me and say, are you trying to put us under the law? And I say, absolutely not. But are you trying to tell me that you're above the law? Oops, no, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that the Torah is completely done away with. And so I say, well, look at Psalms 119, one through three. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. And what do they do? They walk in his ways and it's not a problem. So no, we do not believe we're under the law. Neither do we believe we're above the law. The Torah's in our heart, and so we walk in that. And guess what? We're under mercy and grace. People don't understand the Torah is full of mercy and grace. Now let's look at Joel chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, which is another part of the Hof Torah. It says, blow the shofar in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly and gather the people. 
Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. And then it says, let the bridegroom leave his room, the bride her bridal chamber, between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord. Don't make your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? You know, I used to think, you know, what are the consequences of sin? You know, a lot of us, wow, we don't want to sin because I might go to hell. And if I... Don't sin, I get to go to heaven. It's all about me. The greatest consequence of sin is the agonizing grief and disappointment to God. You broke his heart. But too often, we don't want to be saved from our sins. We just want to be saved from the consequences. But God wants to save us from our sins. And the thing is, do we care? Are we crying out, Lord, spare your people? Now I added a verse here that's not on your notes. You can just write the verse reference down and then you can listen to it and you can go back later and study it. But this, oh, I'll finish my slide. Go ahead and go back to my slide. Here we see we're under mercy and grace and we know that because look at Exodus 34, six and seven. The Lord, the Lord, a God of what? Merciful. Gracious, he's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He keeps steadfast love for thousands and he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Torah is full of mercy and grace. Now let's listen to Hosea 6, 1 through 3. Again, come and let us return to the Lord. He is torn and he will heal us. He's smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And the third day he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. I don't know how many of you caught that. A day with the Lord is how many years? So after two days or 2000 years, what does it say is gonna happen? He'll revive us. Israel became a nation in 1948. And then it says, after two days, okay, he'll revive us. And then the third day, he's going to raise us up and we'll live in his sight. That's the resurrection of dead and the millennial reign. And guess what? He died in 3030, which means 2030 is at the end of the two days. Just something to think about. Now, Then it goes on and it says, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. Now look at this. His going forth is prepared as the morning and he will come to us as the rain, the latter and the former rain to the earth. That tells you he's coming as the latter rain and he's coming as the former rain, which means he's coming twice. And he comes, now the latter rain is in the spring and the former rain is in the fall. He's already fulfilled the spring feast, so we're not looking for the latter rains, we're not looking for the fall rains. And there's like several different words for rain and you can tell by the Hebrew which is, if it's a spring rain, a gentle rain, a stormy rain or a fall rain. And when you know the Hebrew, you know which rain they're talking about here. Now look at Joel, back to your notes, chapter two, verse 23. It says, be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God. He has given you the former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. We're going to have a double outpouring like in the book of Acts that is gonna be coming. And when it says the first month, that's not January. Now, let me show you another, I'm gonna jump a slide. Okay, let me come here. All right. Now this is important. Look at your notes in Joel chapter 
2, verse 23. It says, Be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And then here is another translation. Let me click on this. Okay, I just have up on the screen what we've just read. But here is another completely accurate Hebrew translation that if you don't know the Hebrew, you don't know this is an accurate translation as well. And you sons of Zion, joy and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given to you the teacher for righteousness. Wow, and he causes to come down to you a shower. So what is this telling us? The Messiah is likened unto water. He's as the rain. And what do we know about the rain cycle? Where does it start? Heaven. And then that comes down. And then what does it do? Return to heaven. And then what does that do? Come down. So the Messiah came down from heaven. He returned to heaven and he's coming back down. He's fulfilling the entire water cycle. So Messiah is the rain. Now we know the very first rain originated in heaven as it was the source of the first rain. And he is the teacher connecting heaven to earth. Isn't that amazing? And we know in Genesis 2, 5, every plant of the field, he said, before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew, the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. So we know the very first rain came down from heaven. Then what do we see in Micah 7, 18 through 20? Who is a God like you? You pardon iniquity. You pass over transgressions for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever. How many of you are glad for that? Because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. And here it is. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Wow. Now that's pretty deep. I mean, to the depths of the sea. That, I mean, that's many miles at the deepest part. So it's, it's how many of us sometimes get offended by people and we don't cast that offense at the depths of the sea. It's right at the surface. <laughs> we turn back 10 years later. Yeah, but look what you did. <laughs> and it's like God says, no, we're going to bury this. Okay, so now we come to Exodus 7, 6 through 9. I brought that in uh, just for the setting here. It says, Moses and Aaron, this is when they're before Pharaoh in Egypt. They did as the Lord commanded them. So did they. Moses was 80 years old. Aaron was 83. So we see Aaron was three years older. When they spoke to Pharaoh. And then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you'll say to Aaron, notice Moses doesn't throw down his staff. Aaron throws down his staff. And it says, cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. Now, most of you know that's not true. If you know Hebrew, it was actually a crocodile. Okay. But aside from that, here's my point. How old was Moses when they appeared? 80. And how old was Aaron? And how long did they wander in the wilderness? Okay. So what do we find now? In uh, Numbers 33, 38 and 39, Aaron the priest went up to Mount Or at the command of the Lord and he dies. In the 40th year after the people of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, on the first day of the fifth month, that's the first of Av, he is the only person in the entire Bible who has their exact date of their death mentioned. And look at this. He says, Aaron was 123 years old when he died. He was 83 when he went in. 40 years makes him 123. And we know he died on the first day of the fifth month. 
Now, let's look at Deuteronomy. Seven months, this is seven, I think it's interesting. Seven months after Aaron dies, Moses dies. And Moses went, that's Violet, here it is. And he spoke these words to all of Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old this day. Happy birthday, Moses. Okay, there it is. He was 120 years old. How old was when he went before Pharaoh? How old was it when he died? 120, that's 40 years. You know what that means? The entire time of the plagues was part of the 40 years. The 40 years didn't start a year later. The 40 years started on Moses' birthday. Now, I want you to catch this because that's when they appeared before Pharaoh. Now, I'm going to bring up a little calendar here. Moses, I have here on the third of that month, was the seventh of Adar. That was Moses' birthday. Okay. And he goes and appears before Pharaoh and the plagues begin. Many people ask me, well, how long did the plagues last? Did they last a year? Did they last six months? Did they last three months? I can tell you exactly how long the plagues lasted. When did they leave Egypt? On what day? Nisan 15. Nisan 14 is Passover. Nisan 15 is when they left. Well, guess what? Here they are. Five weeks later, they leave. It couldn't be shorter or longer or they wouldn't have been 120 and 123 when they died. So the entire plagues took place within a five-week time frame. It is simple math. Okay, so let's go to Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8. Back to our Torah portion. Be strong and of a good courage is what Moses is telling Joshua. Fear not, don't be afraid at them. For the Lord your God, uh, he is going to go with you. He won't fail you, not forsake you. And here Moses calls Joshua now and he says to him in the sight of Israel, be strong and of a good courage. For you're going to go with this people into the land the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. And you are going to cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you, not forsake you. Don't be afraid, neither be dismayed. So God's kind of encouraging Moses. Moses is, uh, you know, encouraging Joshua. And so what happens in verse 9, Moses writes the law delivers it to the priests, the sons of Levi, Levi, that bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Okay, wow. Now, this next verse is the Hakel. The Hakel happens at the end of every Shemitah cycle. And guess what? We just ended the Shemitah cycle this very year on the Feast of Tabernacles, we will do the Hakel and hear the special readings that were just for that day. And look at this, Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 12. Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all of Israel's come to appear before the Lord your God in the place he will choose, I want you to read this law before all Israel and their hearing. Gather the people, the men, the women, the children, even the stranger that's within your gates that they may hear, that they may learn and fear the Lord your God. And what? Do all the words of this law. That brings us to Deuteronomy 31, 17 through 19. God says, Basically, if they don't, my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them. And then God says, I'm going to hide my face. Wow, that is not good. We know from the priestly blessing, God wants to shine his face. When he hides his face, here comes trouble. He says, and they'll be devoured. Many evils and troubles will come on them so that they're going to say in that day, haven't these evils all come on us because our God is not among us? 
And this is scary. God says not only will he hide it, he will surely hide his face in that day for all the evil which they've worked and that they are turned to other gods. And then he says, now therefore write this song for yourselves. Teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. This is the song of Moses. And this song is absolutely incredible. It's like the book of Revelation for the Torah. We need to understand that. So it begins the song of Moses, Ha'azinu. But look at this. I want to show you this. This here, what do we find? There's different Hebrew words for hide. You can play hide and seek, or you can hide from someone because you're afraid. Let's look at some of these uh, different words for hide. We know Adam and Eve hid from God, right? Well, that's one of the Hebrew words. Let me just bring all these up that I have here. And that refers to uh, the hide where they wanted to hide from God. Genesis 3.10. Genesis 18.17, it says, should God hide from Abraham? Well, that's kind of like a, just a cover, like you put a veil or, or a lid over a pot. That's a different word for hide. It's something that, you know, you put it on, you can take it off. The next one is Genesis 35, 4, where Jacob hid idols under an oak tree. And that word for hide means to bury. Like you want to bury treasure, silver, gold. And what else do we bury? Dead bodies. Okay, they all go under the dirt. Well, what's fascinating to me in uh, Genesis uh, 4, 14, we're going to look at that here in just a minute. But let's look at Exodus 19, 5. Here, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed deed and keep my covenant, you will be a peculiar treasure. When you think of treasure, you think of gold or silver. And if you have a, a treasure chest, what do you do? You go bury it somewhere and hope you don't forget where you buried it. Look at Malachi 3, 16 through 18. Those that feared the Lord spoke often one to another and the Lord hearkened and heard it and the book of remembrance was written before him for those that feared the Lord that thought on his name and they will be mine, says the Lord, in the day when I make up my jewels. You are God's gold and silver precious jewels. That is amazing. All right, and then it says, and I will spare them as a man spares his own child that serves him and then shall you return. And then you'll discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. Now, here's an often uh, mistranslated verse in the Bible. Psalm 116, 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's more than precious. It's referring to precious jewels that have been buried in the earth. The real word is costly. Costly is the death of his righteous ones because that's one less person working for the kingdom of God. And then we have uh, Esther. I haven't even heard of the book of Esther and you don't find God there. Here they're having their time of trouble and God has surely hidden his face. Look at Revelation 6, 15 through 17. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, mighty men, slave, every free man, what did they do? They hid themselves in the caves and the rocks and they asked them to fall upon them. And it says, we want to hide us from God's face who's sitting on the throne. This is like a bomb shelter they want to go run into. But Isaiah 59, one and two says, the Lord's hand isn't shortened that it can't save. It's not heavy that it can't hear. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have what? Hidden his face. That's what we need to realize. Well, I had all of that because going back to Deuteronomy 31, 18, God says, I will hide my face. I will surely hide my face. That's kind of like a double hiding. Ever since Adam and Eve, man has been playing hide and seek with God from the day of creation, ashamed of our nakedness to hide from God. And uh, man now hides from God as well. So let me, let me, uh, one of the things that's interesting in the book of Esther, 
There was no distinction between Esther or Mordecai and the non-Jewish Persians. Everyone thought everyone was a non-Jewish Persian. They were hiding their identity. Even their names. The name Esther comes from the goddess Ishtar. Mordecai comes from the god Marduk. They were totally hidden. And so what we need to understand is that we need to not hide our identity. Okay? Now, I'm ready to close this up. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, 20 through 23. Let me go over here for a second. For when I brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, and I swore to give their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and grown fat, they're going to turn to other gods and serve them, and they're going to despise me. Wow, not only did they break God's covenant, they did it in spite. And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song will confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know they're inclined to do, even today, before I have brought them into the land that I swore to give them. And it says, so Moses wrote this song the same day, taught it to the people of Israel. He gave Joshua, the son of Nun, a charge. And he said, be strong and a good courage because you're the one that's got to bring these rebel rousers <laughs> into the land. And then in Deuteronomy 31, 24 through 27, it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of the law in a book until they were finished. Moses commanded the Levites that bore the Ark of the Covenant saying, take this book of the law, put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you, for I know your rebellion, your stiff neck. Well, I'm even still alive with you this day. You have been rebellious against the Lord and how much more after I die? And then verse 28 through 30, gather to me all the elders, your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears. How many remember the book of Revelation? He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. I'm going to call heaven and earth to record against them, for I know that after my death, you're going to utterly corrupt yourselves, turn aside from the way which I've commanded you, and evil's going to befall you in the latter days, because you're going to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. So Moses spoke in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And that's next week. Next week, we're going to go over the song of Moses, which is very prophetic. Uh, but again, I think it is so significant that this Torah reading is always between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur during the 10 days of awe when God wants us all to check our lives and make sure, are we ready for Yom Kippur when the court is closing the books and then the following week, Judgment is meted out during the Feast of Tabernacles. In case you didn't know, the 40 days from Elul 1 to Yom Kippur is the same 40 days that Moses went up to the mount to get the tablets. It's the same 40 days that Yeshua was in the wilderness. It's the same 40 days that Jonah spoke to Nineveh. And when you read the text, what does he do? He goes out and builds a sukkah and he sits there for Sukkot waiting to see if judgment's gonna fall on Nineveh. That's what's going on. So let me, I think I skipped over something I want to show you. We went over that and that. Oh, uh, was, no, it's sliding on me. I wanted to show you this. I skipped this slide. I want you to know, those of you that were at our Rosh Hashanah service, I handed out a list of Jubilees. I have the new and improved one. And it is sitting on that back table and it lists every Jubilee since creation and every Shemitah year since creation. But on the other page, it was like 12 columns wide. I made two, seven wide columns because it's seven times seven years. And so I have a new thing that lists every Jubilee year, all the Shemitah cycles clear back to creation. But I want you to notice something here. 3757 is the biblical year when Messiah was born. 
I have, if you see where he's standing there preaching, that's in Luke when he stands up and he proclaims liberty. Do you remember when we said our morning prayers at the beginning, the entrance of your word brings freedom. Well, he was born on the Feast of Tabernacles and that's when you proclaim liberty and he was born in the Shemitah year and at the end is when he stood up and proclaimed that, proclaiming freedom. If you'll notice, it, I have that little picture there by 3788. That, every one of these, uh, I have black for AD, red for BC, the brown is the biblical year. Well, 3788 was the first year of a new cycle. The year before, 3787, was a Shemitah year. We know it because it's divisible by seven. And so here, this is when he stood up at the Feast of Tabernacles. The amazing thing is, if you look at the left to the yellow column, that 49 years was the 77th Jubilee. Can you imagine that? The 77th Jubilee is when he did his ministry. And I have at the very bottom by those eclipses, above it is 541. It was the 541st Shemitah, and the gematria in Hebrew of Israel is 541, and he came to the children of Israel. You can't make this stuff up. And then you have solar, you go to NASA's website, there were solar and lunar eclipses right after his ministry started. And then look at this in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, the same thing, solar lunar eclipses. But anyway, so here on Yeshua's birthday, the year of release is proclaimed. Only God can do this. So thank you so much. Let's stand and we're going to pray. And then we'll take a break for a little bit. Then we'll come back. We'll have worship. And then you get to hear from Pastor Lance. Yay! <laughs> Woohoo! All right, let's pray. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. We pray, Lord, that your word would have an effect on our hearts. God, we have to leave differently than when we came in. And we don't want to leave with just more information. We want to leave with our hearts changed, our relationship back to you, uh, being returning to you and being restored. We love you. You're our Abba, our Daddy, and we just want to grow in relationship with you. And Father, I thank you so much for all those that are here, as well as all those that are live streaming from all over the world for their tithes, offerings, Lord, to continue to magnify the Torah and to make it honorable. We know in these dark times, the only thing that's going to be a light is your word. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. And I thank you for all those that enable us to continue to magnify you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break.